to open your Bibles at that text, Exodus, sorry, Genesis chapter 15. I can't even find it in my Bible. I think it's here somewhere. It's at the beginning. At, near the beginning, <laughs> isn't it? I was looking in Revelation. It is a revelation, of course. And it's all part of God speaking to us in various ways. And in various times, of course, let's pray. We come like God expecting to be made stronger in you because in us we do see our weaknesses and we do see our need to be renewed, revived, restored, lifted up, delivered from the constant tyranny of the flesh and of the evil around us. Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you prayed with me that prayer. I've got another prayer. No, it's not quite a prayer. It's about prayer, of course. And uh, it's something that Ron sent me during the week. Thanks, Ron. Yeah. And it was a, it's a translation, actually, of, of a sign found in a church in France where the mm -hmm. public are invited, of course, to step in and seek the Lord. It says, when you enter this church, it may be possible that you hear the call of God. However, it is unlikely that he will call you on your phone. <laughs> Thank you for turning off your phone. If you want to talk to God, enter. Choose a quiet place and talk to him. If you want to see him, send him a text while you're driving. <laughs> and I've added a rider. And if you don't want to see him, text while the sermon is being preached. <laughs> Okay, so the text, the context is the Word of God. That's our focus now. Got your attention? I trust I have. Uh, it's been a roller coaster ride this week, hasn't it? For many of us, 50 years of marriage. How has it happened, Rob and May? Uh, don't answer that, May. I don't have to. Be able to forgive one another. Exactly. Good words, good words. Exactly. And the daughter, and I'm glad the maths work out here, the daughter, 45 years old. Good. Yesterday. Yesterday. Mm, that was great. Yes. And then, just a week ago, uh, a couple, a relatively young couple, re, uh, reaffirming their marriage vows. And then, less than a week later, we say, say goodbye to Lynn. I'm tearing up with you, but <laughs> bless you anyway, as you uh, go through this. And then, as for me, it's been a roller coaster for me too. Tuesday, it was a stress test at the Caboolture Hospital so that I could see whether I should be playing Carol in the table tennis <laughs> tournament or not. I think that was the reason for it. I, I don't know what other reason the doctor could have sent me for it. Uh, anyway, I survived the table tennis last night, and as we all did, and that was a good time. That was part of the roller coaster ride. Tuesday, the stress test. Last night, the table tennis test. And then on Wednesday, something. I would never have chosen to do, go to a ballet, Cinderella. Compliments of our eldest son, Stuart. He wanted us to take his two daughters, an eight-year-old and an 11-year-old, 11, 11 to wow. see, 12-year-old to see Cinderella. What a night out that was. It had if I'm not converted. <laughs> And I still remember, I still like the uh, Cinderella as I remember the, the story in primary school. But it was a little bit of culture. Yeah. And uh, now, of course, Sunday morning coming down, <laughs> here we are. Uh, we're trying to find out what the Lord is doing in our lives. Because after all, life is very much a tug of war. Would you not agree? It has its ups and downs, its highs and its lows, its struggles and its celebrations. We can enjoy them all. Yes, we can even enjoy the suffering if we know where it's all leading us to. But life is a tug of war and uh, it's not an easy 
road to hoe. It's not an easy tug of war because, after all, let's face it, it is a tug of war of flesh and spirit. And we're living in the flesh. We're living with bodies that hurt, bodies that bring us joy. And we feed them, we nourish them, we uh, seek to look after them as best we possibly can. We want a healthy bank account. We want to enjoy life. And so God willing, Joan and I will be taking our van and we'll be travelling a thousand kilometres north uh, just to enjoy the uh, creation that God has uh, given us to enjoy. Uh, in all this, Satan is at work too in our lives to pull us down, to try us. And so, yes, it is a, a, a trial of flesh and spirit. And I'm sure that was Abram's experience. We turn to Abram. Can anybody tell me the first chapter of the Bible where you find the word Abram? Chapter 9. Uh, good, good try. It, uh, yeah, just a couple of chapters further on. By chapter 9, uh, Noah is getting out of the ark, right? And then the, the three sons <laughs> with their wives all have a lot of children. And one of them was called Terah. And Terah had a son called, well, he had three sons. Fermat? 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 Don't know Terra that name. Terah <laughs> Where's that? That's yeah. Um, in chapter 11, we meet Terah. And he had three sons, Nahor, uh, Haran, and Abram. And he also had a half-daughter half-daughter, I say. Well, I don't know whether it was Terah's half-daughter, Sarah, but uh, Abram married her, his half-sister. Maybe it was on the mother's side. I don't know. That's chapter 11. Chapter 12, we find God speaking to this Abram. Uh, have you heard God speaking to you lately? You've got to listen carefully sometimes, haven't you? And then there are other voices in our minds pulling us in other directions. Was that the Lord speaking? I, I get the impression just reading Genesis that there was no mistaking the voice of the Lord. Abram knew it was God calling him to leave Ur of the Chaldees and go to a country that God would show him. He didn't even tell him where at that stage. A little bit like me going to Bible college uh, for missionary service, not knowing where, but thinking that I would be working somewhere in Australia with Aborigines, not realising that I would be on the other side of the world within 18 months, within two years. Yes, God's call was unmistakable for Abram, and it can be unmistakable for you and I too if we have ears to listen. Flesh versus spirit. Which voice will we be listening to? Uh, of course, it is the flesh that will be a loud, clear voice, won't it? Oh, I know it all too well. Uh, somebody said, new devil, new devil. You want to go on with the Lord? You want to go on a bit further with him? Then you'll have new challenges, new temptations coming your way. The flesh just doesn't give up. It just keeps on nagging at us and just keeps on demanding our attention, demanding <coughs> satisfaction. And we need to rise above that and uh, find a place for the spirit and the spiritual world in our living. That's tough. That's a tough assignment. And I haven't quite got it right yet, but I'm working on it. Don't we all know Christians, well, people who profess to be Christians? And they say all the right things, and they're at church, and so forth, but then you look at things they've done in their lives, and things that are happening, ooh, I don't think that was really very Christian. Uh, I even think of our own Prime Minister, who uh, made a profession in his maiden speech of... Uh, being a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and taking that Lord into his politics and his regular attendance at a church on the south side of Sydney. 
And then last week he was reported as calling somebody an effing somebody, a, a politician from Tasmania. That from the mouth of our Prime Minister who professed in his maiden speech to be a follower of Jesus. Flesh and spirit in, in opposition, antagonising one another if you like. It's a challenge to get it right. And we do certainly need the Billy Grahams of our worldly people, well, the mentors, the people that we can look up to, the ones that Ron was talking about in his communion talk. We need more Apostle Pauls among us and uh, yeah, John Wesley's and uh, William Wilberforce's and so forth. And certainly in our day and age of uh, lost politics and lost society. Yes, we need a strong anchor for our tug of war. Yes, I, I think it was, I think Abram knew this struggle as I read uh, chapter 15, now verse uh, 2. Because the Lord said to him, Do not fear, Abram. And I see a tug of war there, or more particularly, flesh and spirit there. If you get the context, you've got to get the context before you realize that. You've got to read Genesis chapter 14. And it uh, really boggled my mind when I read this. But nothing much has changed. You know, the various Aboriginal tribes, even to this day, at animosity one with another. They are a different colour. They're a different skin. So we can't go through their territory to get to Wigton or wherever we're going. We've got to go around their territory. Uh, we don't hear too much of uh, bloodshed as a result these days. But then you only have to go to Africa and you see that tribalism coming to the fore in all sorts of ugly ways. And so we had Mugabe of Zimbabwe for years and years and years because he was a stronger tribal leader, able to overcome the opposition and rig the elections or whatever. It's rife in Africa. I guess it's rife in Australian politics too, at a different level, isn't it? Well, in chapter 14 there were these kings, they're called kings, uh, tribal leaders if you like, who decided to attack, and they attacked Sodom, Gomorrah, and places like that and took captive, even took captive Lot. Remember the nep nephew of Abram took him captive. And so this incensed Abram to the extent that he decided that enough is enough. I'm going to get these guys and I'm going to bring Lot back. And so in verse 14 of chapter 14, we see Abram, when Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he led out his trained men born in his house, 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan in the north. 318. I think of some uh, landholders here in Australia. I wonder how many Australian landholders with properties as big as Switzerland would have 300 men to call upon. They are the ones that, uh, that could bear arms. He wouldn't have left his sheep and cattle uh, alone. There would have been shepherds back as well. So imagine Abram with 500 men to call upon to do whatever needed to be done. He was quite some bod by this stage. Uh, and he actually rescued uh, Lot and uh, delivered not only Lot, but the king of Sodom and others as well. So it was quite something, quite a physical thing, quite a fleshly thing, if you like. So when we read in chapter 15, God saying to Abram, do not fear, was he thinking or referring back to this kind of thing, right Abram, this is life, but don't fear, I'm with you. Or was it the spirit 
Was it the fleshly? Uh, was it the spiritual thing? Hear my God right before you, but don't be afraid. I'm not going to hurt you. You know, is it that? You know, when you fall into the hands of the living God, it can be a fearful thing. When you, I suppose, it's probably just as well that life is mundane by and large, that we don't see God standing in the room or sitting in the room. I would be afraid to preach if I could see God here with me right now. But by faith, I know that he is here, but he's not frightening us, is he? So he's saying, do not fear on the spiritual side. He's saying, do not fear on the physical side either, because I'm with you anyway. In both those circumstances, I'm with you. I'm the one who's going to be a shield to you. Your reward will be very great. Yes, just keep close to this God who you've no need to fear. Remember, perfect love casts out fear. I think I'm quoting from 1 John chapter 4 at that point. It's in my notes, but I've lost my place in my notes. So, oh, it's verse 18. I've, just, I've got good reading glasses. I just glanced down wrong and I saw the, the, the reference. It's 1 John 4, 18, if you want to take note of that one. Uh, and uh, so we... we we need to fear the Lord, but when we learn to fear the Lord, we don't need to fear the Lord. I think one verse of Amazing Grace sums that up nicely too, doesn't it? And when we fear the Lord, I guess really we don't need to fear our circumstances either. But we do, if you're as fleshly and as human as me, we do tend to fear our circumstances. Oh, how is God going to bring good out of this circumstance. It's ugly, it's long-lasting, it's not going away. God doesn't seem to be doing anything, but he's saying, don't fear. Don't fear your circumstances. Don't fear the kings of uh, the east coming to uh, get your nephew or you. Don't fear. <clears throat> don't fear in the ordinary <coughs> mundane of life, which sometimes isn't so mundane and isn't so ordinary. I suppose it would be nice if life was day after day just mundane. It would be so much easier, wouldn't it? But then we have our frustrations because we have desires in the flesh that uh, aren't being properly met. Uh, we have disappointments. What a disappointment it must be for you, Janet, at this time of your life as you think of a beautiful daughter. Disappointments. How do you cope? And I have some prayer notes here that can be even worse than that. Today's Open Doors prayer note is for the uh, Christians in Mol the Maldives, testifying of uh, improved spiritual atmosphere in their country now. Mul uh, the Maldives were one of the worst as far as persecution of Christians is concerned. But it's suggesting that we continue to pray for some of the issues facing locals in the Maldives. And you can translate this to Australia too. Let me read the list. Like drug addiction. Sound familiar? Like high divorce rates. Like gangsters. Witchcraft. Pray that Christians may be bold in sharing the gospel in that context. Flesh and spirit, flesh at war with the spirit, but the spirit, I trust, at war with the flesh too. Do not fear, says, that, says God to Abram. What? Because of the holiness of the Lord speaking? Yes. Do not fear, even though it is me, the Lord, speaking to you. I'm not here to hurt you. But without faith... It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Our God is a consuming fire, after all. So we need to be careful there. Do we, we, we do. Sometimes we do need to fear. And other times we only need to fear because it is reverence for the living God. So it's either uh, giving up our fear of the Lord and or fear of circumstances because after all, in the end, in the long run, God will take 
care of those circumstances. I just want to turn to a text in the book of Hebrews. Remember that chapter, Hebrews 11? It's a great chapter, isn't it? It is, but it's not at the same time. It's a horrible chapter. These people who had faith, and look what they went through because they had faith. We're living in Australia, and it, we're only just touching on persecution of Christians in our country, legalised persecution of Christians in Australia. It's coming. But look at uh, this chapter of uh, people who believed God without receiving the promises, verse 13, for instance. It seemed that God wasn't honouring his promises. I think Abram felt that. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Romans 4. He believed God when God said, I'm going to make your offspring as plentiful as the stars in the sky that you see. And it didn't happen. Year after year, Abram still didn't have, get his wife pregnant. It just wasn't working. Eventually, at a hundred years old, Abram did have a son, and he called him. Do you remember the name of the son? Starting with I? Ishmael. No, not iPhone. Ishmael. Well, he, yeah, Ishmael. And then, by the time he was a hundred, he had Isaac, the, the child of promise. Isn't that great? Yes. Uh, so he had two sons. One, and I think Galatian brings it out, Carolyn, one was a child of the flesh, Ishmael. That was, oh, well, I'll help God out here. So he did something, or rather Sarah, his wife, did something that no Australian wife that I know would ever say. Here, take my, uh, take my servant girl. <laughs> Can you imagine an Australian wife saying that? No, but uh, it happened. Uh, uh, Ishmael was the result. But then God's promise came to fruition eventually. In his time, in his way, it came to fruition. I read Hebrews 11, verse uh, 39. All these things, having gained approval through their faith, or sorry, all of these, all of these people, all of these personages of the Bible, uh, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us they would not be made perfect. Yeah, well, what good plan has God got for you and for me? Even though we may not receive the great rewards that uh, the Bible promises in this life. Remember last year I talked about... Uh, the abundant life and what that meant. It doesn't mean lots of uh, lots of houses and lots of cars and, uh, and lots of luxury in life at all. As I searched through the scripture on that abundant life definition, I discovered that it was purely and solely spiritual. That's where the promises are, the promise of abundant life. And if we have those those uh, promises at work in our life, if we have those inner qualities of the spirit within us, then we can cope with the circumstances, the outward circumstances, even though those outward circumstances may not change in a hurry. We may have to live with what we've got in the, in the flesh. But be fortified by the tools of the spirit that God has for us. Well, there's a lot more that I could say. I've only really just touched on my notes here, and there are only, what, three blue lines there. That's my sermon notes. And I've only just begun. Uh, you know, Abram, let me just finish with this. Abram became Abraham, of course, in a few chapters further on. Abram had his temporal battles, and he was just an ordinary bloke in many respects. And I, have, I don't think he had any idea of really the uh, consequence of being Abram. 
You see, you read Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, and you see that it was through Abram, Abraham, that the Messiah came. Because Abram had faith and believed God and remained obedient to God, God was able to work out his purposes through him so that eventually he had Isaac and then he had Jacob and Joseph and uh, the children of Israel. Yeah, what happened? What happened to the Egyptians? His little aside. What happened to the Egyptians in the Dark Ages? They turned on the Israelites. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I, I hasten <laughs> on. Uh, Abram had a much bigger purpose than just living as a grazier in Palestine. There's the point that I'm making. And he has a much bigger thing going on in your life than sitting at the uh, keyboard on a Sunday morning or uh, sweeping the, the pathway faithfully every Sunday morning uh, or uh, going to work or whatever. He's, I mean, God has got something much bigger than just that. Who knows where our lives are heading in the scheme of the kingdom of God. But remember, there is a big picture and while it seems to be a tug of war picture at the moment, and while there are plenty of frustrations about the flesh getting in the way, nonetheless God is working his purpose out. And I just want to remind you that the Messiah had a name, and his name was Jesus. So, let the Spirit reign. And if the Spirit reigns in your thinking, in your daily ambitions, then of course it goes, it follows on, that it'll be Jesus that will be your guide in life. Let it be, let it be that Jesus will have his way. Oh, it'd be nice to finish with a story, wouldn't it? And I think I have got one here that uh, Joan gave me some time ago. If I, yeah, here it is. <laughs> Listen to this. <clears throat> you might think uh, life is pretty ordinary at times. Even being a missionary might feel very ordinary. Think of the minks there in Papua New Guinea and us when we were in Lebanon. It was just very ordinary living, but being a neighbor to our neighbors, that sort of thing. And uh, here is somebody who wrote a letter to the non London newspapers uh, there was a lot of criticism of missionary endeavor in those days. Yeah, don't upset their culture. They have been living that way for thousands of years. Don't go in as missionaries and make Christians out of them. And so the newspapers were having quite a good time of this, of, of criticizing Christianity. So this fellow, who had been a world traveler, wrote a letter to the papers defending missions. In it, he said that the transformation of wild savages in the Isles of the South Seas, Pacific, was something to behold. And that to make light of this was a heinous crime. In a voyager, to forget these things is base ineptitude. For should he chance to be at the point of shipwreck on some unknown coast, he will most devoutly pray that the lesson of the missionary <laughs> may, <laughs> may, be, may have preceded him. Otherwise, you'd be part of a potluck stew. <laughs> the writer of the letter, Charles Darwin. Quite unexpected, but yes, he could see, even in his agnosticism, I was going to say atheism, became atheism, but in his agnosticism, whoops, that's a... It didn't break, it didn't break him. Uh, and he could see that there was good coming out of Christianity. Out of ordinary people going to extraordinary lengths to share the gospel. And uh, so, why don't you start with your local church? Yeah, if, if the Lord is calling you to be a missionary in Fiji or the Bahamas or Tahiti, mm, Yes, yeah, so be it, but uh, maybe he wants you to serve him right here at Living Hope.
I look around this room and I see heaps of people who are faithfully here serving God, not getting paid dollars.